Perfect. Okay, does that look good? Perfect. Okay, yeah, so thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, Nick and I are here today to talk about 1255, which we will discuss what that is and what it means. Um, but for starters, this is just the title slide. And just to quickly kind of go over our, the agenda, we're gonna try and keep the formal presentation part brief, just jump in, give you a little bit of background on our story, and then uh, go into some case studies about some of the projects we've been working on specific to sports analytics, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So just high level, that's what we're gonna talk about. And then we'll jump in and I'll turn it over to Nick to tell you a little bit about himself and his background. Thanks, Jake. Uh, we're certainly excited to be here. As Mark uh, said at the beginning, my name is Nick, one of the two O'Connell brothers presenting uh, today. I went to Bentley 2016 to 2020, graduated right in the middle of the pandemic, which was fun. Happy to answer some questions about that as well after because that was quite an interesting experience. Uh, after I graduated, I went uh, to a larger company called Boston Scientific, and then I've had some experience in much smaller companies as well. So I like to think I bring the 1255 into this presentation tonight, some experience in both uh, super large companies and super small companies as well. And then I'll just mention, I think Mark already said this, but while I was at Bentley, I majored in HR management or management with the HR concentration, I think is what it is now. Um, but my connection to the CIF sandbox is that I had a minor in computer information systems as well. Um, so, so, so I took at least part of the course load uh, and do have some background in uh, CIS. And so at 1255, which I'll touch on in a few more slides, uh, I specialize in product, UI, UX, uh, and operations as well. So Jake, uh, you can introduce yourself now. Thank you. Yeah, so as Mark said, I graduated from Bentley in 2019. I was a, sand a sandbox tutor for three and a half years while at Bentley, I think. So I started the spring semester of my freshman year on a volunteer basis. So definitely super familiar with the sandbox and happy to be back. Uh, still very close with Mark and appreciate being here. And my path out of college was I went straight into startups. So, you know, two days after graduation, I started at a sports company that was a startup at the time. Uh, and spent two years there. It grew very quickly from, you know, under 20 employees to 500 employees. Um, it's uh, it's called three-step sports. Um, it's mostly youth sports and events and things like that, but also data and media for ESPN, NFL draft, things like that. And then after leaving that startup in 2020, toward the end of 2020, I went to another startup, which was much smaller, uh, and that was in insurance, so insure tech, building a platform for the automation of certificates of insurance. So that company's called Certificate Hero. Um, and I stayed there for about a year and a half, two years. And now uh, 2021 is when 1255 came about. And I'll let Nick tell you a little bit about what 1255 is, but as you can see already, it's you know family run, uh, two brothers that started something. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Nick, to kind of go into our story. Yeah, sure. So thanks, Jake. Um, what is 1255? Um, I, when Jake and I both graduated, we were doing, like Jake said, our, our own different things, small companies all the way down to employee number one in Jake's case. But we always started to notice when we would talk about our careers and what we were working on uh, that we noticed some similar patterns, right? We noticed that we both had shared this passion for taking someone's vision, taking a, an idea and translating it into a product. So like building... Uh, the designs and the and the user experience and creating a proof of concept. We also realized that we love building or trying to uh, businesses from the ground up. So that entrepreneurial spirit that I think Bentley uh, teaches us when, when we're on campus to to take something and, and build it and grow and um, start from nothing and build it into something, or at least again try to. And we also noticed that we like working hard together. We're brothers. We've always done team projects together. We took the same classes in high school. And so we just wanted to try and do something together. That element of a family business was always exciting to us. And so what we're trying to do now for 1255 is build up this brand through the things that we think we're good at and share similar skills in. And that's short-term business development, as Jake noted, short-term contracts. We're taking less than a year working with clients, building either MVPs for the client to use, or which we'll touch on in a later case study, 
building a proof of concept. So maybe the, the client wants to test out an idea or they want to improve a product, but where they're not really sure what it looks like, 1255 can come in and, and build out what that product could potentially look like so that the, the client can then say, okay, yeah, this is great. Thank you. We're going to move forward with this. Or uh, in some cases they say, okay, this actually proved the point in the opposite direction. This isn't worth pursuing. Uh, so we're going to go in a different direction and both have, have strong value for sure. And then the last piece is process automation. So we also have worked with clients that have either tech that's very outdated or a process that has a lot of um, manual human data entry that could be optimized and uh, just vastly improved in terms of efficiency and output. And so we also like to specialize in that area uh, as well. And so Jake sums it up often nicely on the following slide, uh, probably much more succinctly than that. So Jake, go ahead there. Yeah, so we right now we're an agency that, and we work with a variety of clients and we're still figuring out what our specialty will be. But as you can see from what Nick said, we do pretty much everything under the sun. So we do have a background in software engineering. So a lot of what we do is prototyping and MVPs, but we will kind of jump in at any stage of the business process, whether it's a big company that wants to start, one division wants to investigate a new product, or it's a startup that doesn't even exist yet, and they want to build a POC to see if they can get traction, uh, to see if it you know proves itself from a technical feasibility standpoint. And we're just open to all right now, and we'll eventually narrow down and figure out what our focus is as an agency. Um, but right now and today, we're going to talk specifically about you know two case studies of clients that we've worked with and some projects that we're coming off of right now that we've spent you know the better part of a year on uh, that are related to sports science. So. This first case study, we worked with uh, a large sports company that wanted to build a new product. So this was an existing company, uh, lots of money, lots of employees, lots of success. And they had an existing customer base and wanted to see if they could build a new product to sell to that customer base. So client is a large sports company. The goal, they want to build a new product. Um, the domain was computer vision. So the idea was they wanted to build a piece of software that could ingest highlight films for football players. So American football, uh, you've got high school football players that play four years of uh, high school football and they have a highlight film that shows all the plays where they've you know performed really well in games. And they wanted to be able to take those highlight films, run them through a piece of software and output on the other side, the speed of the football players on the field. So how fast are these players running? What are their top speeds? If you've got a running back that can run, you know, 22 miles an hour, he's going to be really hard to chase down. Uh, and that's a great you know, piece of information for colleges to have as part of the recruitment process. So the problem in this case, the challenge was that they wanted to get to market in four months. And the reason for that was because there were other competitors in the space and their clients were considering options and they wanted to be able to come out and hit the market immediately. Uh, and that's really difficult to do from a software engineering standpoint, as anybody in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the Zoom here knows if you develop software uh, or have written code before that having a short window to build something is very, very challenging. Um, so the way we tackled this uh, from a constraint standpoint is basically what you wanna figure out when you're working with a client like this and they say, hey, we need to get to market as soon as possible. Yeah, everybody wants to get to market as soon as possible. But if you can figure out what are the actual constraints here? Uh, is it time to market? Is it budget? Is it customer requirements? So are there specific things that the, app, the application absolutely must do? The software has to do these five things. Um, is there a budget? So this division says, hey, we got approval to spend 50 grand investigating this new software. Or we have $100,000 or we have a million dollars. That's really important to understand. And then obviously in this case, the time to market. So how important is it that we get to market in four months? Is that you know, a non-negotiable? Uh, in this case, it was. They needed to get to market in four months. What we figured out looking at the project is, you know, we're building a pretty advanced piece of software here where we're going to be ingesting film. We need to be able to use computer vision to understand what's going on. Very similar to what, you know, Tesla would do with understanding where the road is and where the car needs to go. We need to understand what a football field looks like. Where are all the players on the field? How quickly are they getting from point A to point B? Uh, there's a lot of complexity that goes into that. And as we took a step back and work with the client, we figured out that this was going to be something that likely we needed a year to get up and running to the point where it was customer ready, ready for prime time. Uh, and that just wasn't an option in this case. So what we ultimately decided was, okay, we're going to build an MVP first. 
And I love this graphic that's up on the screen because oftentimes the client comes to you and says, you know, we want a Ferrari. We want something to get from point A to point B. We want to do it in style. We want to do it as quickly as possible. But ultimately the real problem that you're solving is getting from point A to point B. So if time to market is a, you know, something that's really critical, then you can start with something like a skateboard, which you can see here because the skateboard still works. You know, you can get from point A to point B. Does it take a lot more time? Yes. If you're driving, if you're going hundred miles on a skateboard, it's going to take you a lot longer than in a Ferrari. Uh, it's also going to require a lot more effort and uh, human manpower to get from point A to point B, but it works. Uh, versus if you start by trying to just say, okay, we're going to go straight for the Ferrari and you build one little piece at a time, it's not usable until you're all the way at the end of the process and you have the Ferrari. So we wanted to build something that was usable from the start, but that we could build in four months. Um, and that's ultimately what we ended up doing is we said, okay, we're going to build you something that can get to market in four months. It's not going to have all the bells and whistles, but it's going to get the job done. And ultimately that was the creative problem solving that we approached with this client is we said, we laid out a timeline to say, the customers need in four months, we're gonna build you a skateboard. Uh, we did that. So we delivered on that. This was last year. So by March of 2021, sorry, 2022, we had delivered a skateboard and it was usable. We were able to sell the product based on that. It went off to huge success. And the only problem was, is that there was a lot of uh, interns, you know, doing a lot of the data entry stuff that we wanted to eventually automate. And we did that as well. So over the summer, we went from the skateboard to more like a moped. So in August, we were running with a moped uh, lo a lot faster, uh, a lot less you know, manpower involved, but still not the Ferrari that the client was looking for. Uh, in between August and today, we have now gotten to the point where we're closing in on that Ferrari and actually set to deliver this product uh, next week. So I know that was a lot, but the, the overarching point here is from an engineering standpoint, oftentimes, the client, or if you're in a, in a startup, you know, uh, you could be part of a team, the customers are going to want the moon, and you can't necessarily deliver that uh, with the given constraints. So if you can identify a really solid MVP and a process to move from that MVP all the way up to, you know, the Ferrari of your application, then you're golden. Then it's just execution. Um, yeah. And I'll also say, Jake, to touch on that, yeah. um, that wouldn't have worked without communicating with the client directly, talking to them understanding what are the must-haves right now versus what are the nice-to-haves that we can put into a V2 or V3. Um, and I think that's a pivotal step in, this, in creating a MVP is that first part, right? What is the minimum feature that is required uh, for, for us to be able to launch in four months? And so we had to figure out like outputting the player's speed uh, was a minimum feature that we needed to have regardless. Uh, and then, and then we slowly build on top of that. So I think that's a really important part as well. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Because sometimes it can be hard to, you know, communicate from a technical standpoint, how hard is this actually to do? So you need to be able to break it down into terms that, you know, a non-technical stakeholder understands. So I 100% agree. Um, in this, like to get a little bit into the detail on this. So we're obviously, anybody who watches sports, uh, especially football, you may have seen uh, there's something called next gen stats. So AWS uh, and the NFL, you might see this on the screen at some points when they're breaking down a play, as you can see the speed of a player. Sometimes they'll do, you know, important statistics that are related to how a player is performing in a game or how a team's performing. You might see things like time to separation, uh, separation speed, top speed is often something that's, you know, cool, measurable to look at. You can see a player is running 22 miles an hour. Uh, and so when we go into a project like this, another thing to consider is, yes, this has already been done, right? There are teams out there that have done this. AWS has done this. There are a lot of competitors in the space that have done it, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to do. And it doesn't mean that that solution is gonna work for your client or in your environment. Um, and for us, the really critical part of what we were building is you can look at what's out there, do a literature review and say, okay, here's all the existing solutions. So why can't I just build something that kind of um, emulates what they're doing and just add our own little spice to it. Well, you have to look at the specific challenges that are in, within your environment. And in this case, our problem was, is that we were building a computer vision application that was meant to process high school football uh, film. And the main difference between high school football film and something like college film or NFL film is that high school film is generally recorded by moms and dads in the stands with a handheld camera 
uh, and there's a lot of noise that goes on. There are, you know, we've seen crazy things going on, balloons flying through the screen, uh, the, the camera goes up and down or they act, they forget to stop recording and you know, all of a sudden you're seeing the stands and you're not seeing any of the play. So this is a classic problem with any sort of, you know, data science or analytics that you're doing. Anytime you're building a model is if you put garbage data in, you're gonna get garbage data out. So we didn't have the luxury of working with, you know, perfect broadcast quality film on perfect broadcast quality fields that you would see at the college level and at the NFL level. We were dealing with, and I'll go to the next slide for just a second, but as an example, some of the film, the data that we're ingesting into our model looks like what you're seeing on the screen here. And there's a lot of problems with this, uh, mainly the field. So what we're basically trying to do is, and I'll go back to this slide, is identify the football field. So if we can look at a video, just like Tesla looks at a video of a roadway, and we can identify where the field is. So where are all the lines? How big is the field? What's the distance between the field and the camera, right? We can, we can do a lot of calibration steps uh, by identifying all those artifacts on the screen. And a really critical part about that is the lines in the field. So if we can't see the lines clearly, then it becomes really difficult to understand where the field actually is, which makes it that it's kind of a snowball. Now we don't know, okay, what distance are the players covering over specific periods of time? Because we don't know where the field is, so how are we gonna calculate speed? So that was problem one. Problem two is tracking the players. So let's assume that we can you know, understand where the football field is. Now we need to understand where all the players are on the field. Because if we can do those two things, then we can understand, okay, at time zero, the player is at this position on the field. And at time one, the player is at this position in the field. And we can then understand, okay, here's the distance that that player covered over that period of time. And from that, we can get speed, we can uh, you know, derive acceleration, all sorts of related metrics from that. So when we went into this problem, part of where we said, okay, this is gonna take a year and the client says, okay, but how, how come you can't just use something off the shelf that exists now? How come uh, these other companies have already done this? What's so hard about it? This is when you really dig into the problem and you say, okay, let's look at the specific challenges we're, fo we're focused on. And in this case, it turned out to be bad camera operators and then bad high school football fields. So and we can't get in, yeah, go ahead, Nick. No, I, I was just going to say an important part of that is communicating uh, those challenges to the client as well, because when you're dealing with a very technical solution like Jake's talking about, a lot of the times the clients that we've worked with at least are, are not as technical savvy. So they might look at one of those plays in those fields and, and say, well, of course you can do that, right? You just have to track the player on the field and you can output the speed. So I think a lot of the times it's important in terms of expectation setting and, and just managing the process is, is teaching the client or, or showing the client what our process is and, and why we can't use certain plays and communicating that all the way through. So there isn't um, this lack of trust or, you know, uh, losing credibility. We have to communicate uh, properly with the client. Yeah, 100%. It's sort of that same communication is, you know, surrounds the whole thing from start to finish. Um, and in, in this case, it's also something where as an engineer or a problem solver in general, when you're coming into a project like this, and you're looking at everything. It's not just about, you know, understanding math and understanding code. You have to look creatively at the problem because you can have some of the best models in the world. Uh, and we've actually, you know, worked with and consulted with and, and, uh, sought advice from some of these groups that have developed some of these solutions. And generally their procedure is to throw out plays like this, to say, you know, we can't, we can't work with this. It can't be, it can't be uh, run. So we can't, we can't get a result because it's garbage. Uh, so what we did is we came up with a creative way uh, of solving these specific challenges without, you know, introducing any further complexity from an engineering standpoint. We, we spent a lot of time, and this is where as a partnership, Nick and I worked really well off each other as I do a lot of the, back end, you know, building out a model, feeding in all the, all the traditional ways that you would look at a field, finding the lines using computer vision. Uh, you can even identify the numbers on the field, the key artifacts of the field, putting together a model. Um, but what Nick and I worked with, uh, worked on together is figuring out from a UX standpoint, how can we solve some of these really challenging specific use cases through uh, an interface that's super intuitive for the user to use and can allow them to very quickly manually adjust where the model fails. 
So there's always going to be some sort of validation step when you're using a model like this. How can we streamline that as best as possible so we can get through as much of this high school film as, as possible? Um, and that's where Nick and I really worked uh, a lot together on. It was really satisfying to see that result at the end. Um, and I can kind of show you now as an example uh, on the left side of the screen. This is so this is our model on the on the left side of the screen working. And you can see on the right side is like what a Tesla might look at when it's seeing the road. And then on the left side, I put what we see. So you can see it's not, uh, you know, totally dissimilar where we want to identify the key metric, the key artifacts of the field. Where are the lines? Basically, if we can divide the grid up or the field up into a grid, then we can pinpoint the player's position as he moves through the frame. So what we did is, and this is kind of not something a user would see on the left, but on the back end as a visualization, you can kind of see our model working. And um, that's super high level, but you know, it's a, you, it's a neat little visualization to kind of get a feel for what we're doing and how it works. But it's very similar to what Tesla would do. Uh, we're just doing it not in real time, which you know has pro, there are pros and cons to that. Um, uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was this this case study. So uh, just going back to the beginning, this was what we were trying to do. We have we are now moving out of this project, but this was a really great opportunity to work with a client for about a year. Uh, we actually just crossed over the year mark last week and. Next week, we're going to be delivering and doing a knowledge transfer, turning everything over to their internal team. But they have a fully functioning piece of software, and uh, we have people using it. So it's great as an engineer to see people in the real world using your software, getting results. We have clients paying for it. So overall, this has been huge success. Uh, we can't get into all the specifics of how it works because uh, we don't own this tech. We built it. Um, and it's, you know, this, someone else owns it. So we can't, you know, tell you all the secrets. But that's just an overview of one of the projects we've worked on. Um, and what I'll do now is I'm gonna turn it over to Nick to talk about one other case study we did with a school. But uh, at the end, I can answer questions uh, about you know how all that works, uh, what we just talked about. So I'll turn it over to Nick now. Thanks, Jake. And just back on the uh, first example, I think another one of the unique challenges with uh, a company like 1255 that's building products, uh, but we don't, we, it, the product isn't our business, right? Our business is working with these clients to provide them with this product. And when you do have a handoff, like we're going to have in a week, you have to make sure that the, the UI and the UX is, is able to be handed off, right? So that a team that isn't building the product, it wants to use the product that they can actually get in there and play around with it, regardless of what their tech level is. And so what Jake said, we went back and forth a lot I'm trying to make sure that the, the actual interface of the app uh, is able to be used by a user. So I just mentioned that because product management and product building isn't always just the back end. Obviously, it's not. There is a really important front end component as well, making sure that anyone can come in and use your product. And that often separates uh, the good products from the great ones. Um, so like Jake said, we just wanted to touch on another much shorter example uh, of one of the clients that we've worked with. And we mentioned this one because it's, uh, it's similar in the sense that it's still sports data analytics, but it's very different in the process, in the output. Um, this, this time, just to set the scene, the, the client was a top collegiate football team. Uh, so elite power five, if you're a football person. Um, and their goal was to take one of their current products and basically experiment and see hey, leading up to our, our regular season where we play games, uh, can you build us a, essentially a proof of concept to see if this experiment could work? And that experiment was they had um, essentially a, 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 a process for scouting the opponents that they were going to play. So they had Excel spreadsheets of thousands and thousands and thousands of data points. And that seems crazy for football, but that's, that's true. That's what these coaches use. Um, and they would basically input uh, certain scenarios into the Excel spreadsheet, and it would filter out the trends and the plays that an opponent would run uh, on a, in a certain formation or in a certain down and distance, which is football jargon, but essentially just at certain points during the game, what is the opponent running or, or whatnot. Um, the issue was it's Excel, so it's not super mobile friendly. So when these coaches are out on the practice field or on the game field, they need to take out their phone and, and very quickly go into a mobile app, 
punch in some filters and get an output of what the opponent uh, was running, is currently running, or maybe running uh, in a later quarter or later week. Um, so we really just had a month. I mean, that's even generous. Essentially, the month of August building up to their regular season to see if we could build a proof of concept that they would invest in moving forward. And one of the unique challenges, again, with um, building products that are that are technical, uh, is that you don't always have time to program and build out this extensive product, especially with proof of concept. It, it, a lot of the times, you need to just build a no code tool or, or something that is not technically complex because you have to build it very quickly. Uh, and so the tool that we used is called bubble.io. I'm not sure if anyone on the call is familiar with it. Happy to provide more resources after this uh, on Bubble, but it's a great tool that utilizes no code. So we were actually able to go in without really any sort of program programming and build a mobile app that the coaches can go into and click again, click on these filters and it would output the results. Um, why we gave this example is the client actually didn't end up moving forward with this product for a variety of different reasons. Um, and Jake can attest to this, the product met their expectations. And a lot of the times we've learned that sometimes that's just what happens. The priorities change for the client, budget changes for the client, or it just, you know, it proved their uh, use case wrong and that they don't really need this product. And so we built this for the client, presented it to the client, and they decided that they're not going to use uh, or move forward with this type of product. Um, and so what we learned, Jake, you can go to the next slide here, um, is that not every product is going to be a home run, right? There's still value in, and I say failing, we didn't exactly fail in this case, but um, we, we did take value in that process. We learned how to use a new tool and bubble. Uh, we still got the experience of working with another client. It was by all means a success in the sense that they were pleased with our process, pleased with our communications that just didn't move forward. Um, and so what we also learned is every client's need will be different. So the, the client that Jake mentioned wanted a full-fledged product. They were very committed. They had the budget for it. They knew exactly, pretty much exactly what they wanted. In this case, it was really just a proof of concept. They didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. They didn't know exactly uh, if it would work moving forward. Um, and so that's always interesting uh, to deal with different clients at the same time, because these were ongoing at the same time uh, with, with vastly different needs. And then what we also learned just to close things out, and I think holistically sum up all of this is you just got to keep moving forward, right? We had a very, or will be a very successful handoff in the example that Jake gave. And we also had a very successful handoff in, in the one that I just mentioned. And success, you know, a lot of the times can mean just ending the partnership with the client. Uh, and taking some learnings out of it. And you can't ever take things personally. You got to get to those decision points uh, fast and that's critical to moving forward. Um, so that's it. I think with our core presentation, we just have a slide here that we'll keep up that has uh, our social handles. If you want to give us a follow or reach out with any questions. Uh, but for now, I think we'll open it up to questions or thoughts. Happy to dive into more of what we presented as well. And I don't know the best way to solicit questions, like if that's in the chat or if people just want to talk. I don't know how you do it. You traditionally do it. <laughs> or open anything. <laughs> Nick, do you have any questions for me? Oh, are you hiring? Okay, here's one. Um, uh, not right now, um, but something that we have been work experimenting with lately that has been working really well is we've been working with contractors primarily. So Nick is really great at the operations side of things and managing a, a, an external distributed team. So we have uh, harnessed the power of tools like Upwork to find talent, anywhere really in the world that can help us get through specific problems. So uh, we've been using that, but um, we're still we're still getting our website up and running right now. So we're still new. We, we formed the agency at the end of last year. Um, so we're still uh, in the early stages right now. What resources does it take to start a consulting company like this? Uh, 
you know, it, it depends on what you're doing, like what specifically you want to do with consulting for, at least from my standpoint, I'll let Nick, you know, provide anything that he's thinking. But from my standpoint, ha- after coming out of two startup environments, I saw that there was definitely a need for founders that may not be technical founders where they have a great idea and they want to take it to the next level, but they don't have the resources themselves to build a proof of concept quickly. So they want to partner with somebody who can do that. Um, there, there's it's a it's a great way to say, hey, I have a skill that people might need, so I'm going to make it known that I will do this and I will help uh, help bring your dreams, you know, into reality. So that's kind of the high level theoretical thing that you need to have is some skill that people need. But then otherwise, to start an agency, it's really just you can start as a freelancer. So you could put it up on Upwork and say, hey, I build POCs and MVPs. Uh, You can talk to your friends and tell, have them tell their families. And, you know, if there are people out there that want to build ideas, I'll help. Uh, And then formalizing it, you can start a a partnership. If you have someone that you're working with, you can uh, register a DBA or as a sole proprietorship. So you can say, Hey, I'm, um, you know, I'm picking it. I'm Randy McHugh and I have an agency, uh, you know, Randy McHugh agency, things like that. So you really just need yourself. And Nick, I don't know if you have a better answer. Generally you do. Yeah, no. I, I was going to say a couple of things. One, uh, have I, I'm sure there are multiple ways of, or multiple opinions with this, but I would say pick something or a, a an industry or some type of product area and and be the subject matter expert in that. Because a lot of the time, the the client will turn to you for uh, questions or our recommendations, and if you're not fully studied on that subject matter, you may not be giving the best recommendations. And then I would also say, uh, when you're starting from the ground up, like we are, and people that are young in their career, getting client feedback is very important. So we've already arranged uh, with the client that Jake was discussing that that case study uh, to get their feedback in a written way, do a testimonial, uh, do a press release with that client so we can start to build a reputation and a brand. Because when you don't have that, it's it's difficult to go out and get new clients if they don't know who you've worked with or your quality of work. Uh, so that's that's really important as well. Um, there's some questions in chat. Do you want to just take them and read them? Read them? Yeah, we can. We can. Uh, I'll try and give shorter answers because I have a tendency to drone on. Um, so, is this your only job? So right now, for me, yes, I'm full time. Uh, a lot of this has been engineering work over the past year and a half. Uh, a lot of the projects that we work on are engineering based. So I, you know, I write code all day, most of the time. Um, Nick is still, Nick works at a startup right now. Um, and uh, Nick, if you want to just quickly explain that in 10 seconds or less. Yeah, just, I, I do product management for a FinTech startup um, that I actually got through meeting someone at Bentley. So I think that's one of the next questions as yeah. well. Uh, what tips do you guys have for networking or getting internships while at Bentley? Hmm. I would, I, I didn't, I didn't do this until very late. Uh, and I wish I did it earlier, but utilize career services. And I, I feel like that can't get stated enough. That's like the number one resource I think we have at Bentley. Uh, and they're, the folks over there are there and they want to help. And they certainly helped me get introduced to people. Uh, to optimize your LinkedIn, to get meetings with folks, which may not always turn out to be internships, uh, but just you know, talking to people and getting your name out there is really important. So if you haven't already, go make an appointment with them. Even if it's just one appointment, I, you won't be disappointed. I can pretty much guarantee that. Jake, anything on that? Uh, no, I think that was, um, I think that's a good answer. I will say though, from a startup standpoint too, the way, if you're, if you have any interest in startups or entrepreneurship, what I did at Bentley that got me that my role at, you know, the first startup that I worked at and the second one were both resulted because of connections I made with other Bentley students um, and or through Bentley faculty by, you know, putting it out there. Entrepreneurs, when you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you're seeking some sort of startup uh, experience. Those individuals tend to want to work with one another. So if you put it out there to say, hey, here's what I'm interested in. Um, like there was a Bentley student I posted in the Bentley investment group, met a student I'd never heard of before. We never would have otherwise met, but I made a post to say, Hey, I'm interested in starting a company to do this. 
we tried and it didn't work and it failed. But then three years later, he sent me a text and said, hey, I hope you're doing well. My dad is a serial entrepreneur and he wants to start a company in InsureTech. And sure enough, that turned into a really, really great experience building a company from the ground up because of some connection I made at Bentley just through networking. So it truly is, it sounds cliche, but your network is your net worth. Um, and then we also worked extensively with career services while we were at Bentley and they are really great um, as well. Um, so, and then so quickly moving through this, um, how do you quickly validate an idea so you know if it has legs? Uh, it, it, that also depends on you know what specifically you're doing, but you wanna, if you're building software from a technical standpoint, you wanna, you wanna get something up and running as quickly as possible. So identifying if something's gonna have legs, you wanna identify what's the minimum thing that I can build, prototype, develop, test, whatever, even if it's not in a coding setting, what's the minimum thing I can build to go out and show people, have people use it. So maybe you have a group of friends that you say, hey, I spun something up, would you use this? Um, you wanna spend time taking a step back, using a whiteboard, spending a lot of time figuring out, okay, what is the minimum? What's the bare minimum I could build? Identify what that is and then quickly iterate and get to there as quickly as possible so you can get something out there. It's fail fast all day long. The, the quicker you can fail, the better off you are because the more you'll learn. Um, yeah, and I, I would say too, it, it doesn't need to be um, lots of programming. That's, it's such a blessing that we live in the, in the year that we do that tools like Bubble exist. I mean, if you haven't used it, I would look into it because it's a fantastic tool to just build a proof of concept, something that you can click and use and get someone's hands on it to get feedback. And like Randy said, like validate, um, validate whether or not an idea is going to have legs. That doesn't have to be, you know, this deep, intensive product that has a lot of code behind it, which is great. Um, the next question, you know, the difficulty, the communication difficulty working with non-technical stakeholders, that's like an age old problem that, you know, no matter what domain you're in, it's going to be something that's frustrating, depending on what your relationship is with that, that person, whether it's a client or you could be an engineer in a startup where you're working with the sales team or the executive team to manage expectations. You could be flip-flopped where you could be on the product side and trying to work with an engineering team to build something. Um, or, or it could be operations. I keep, you know, getting back to engineering because that's where my mind is, but it could be any sort of business setting. That's going to always be a problem. And there's no perfect solution to how you do that. But the critical thing is, is that you understand that it's always going to exist and that you never, you know, judge the other group for having opinions and being opinionated because at the end of the day, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to deliver a product. Everybody wants to build the Ferrari. And even though it can be difficult for the non-technical side to understand the complexities involved, and it can be difficult for the technical side to understand the complexities involved in managing the sales side and the customers and time to market, um, you just have to you know, understand each other and that both of you are working toward the same goal and then figure out ways to communicate. So it's like any sort of relationship that you have. You might have ways of communicating with you know, a sibling that are different than ways that you successfully communicate with a friend. So when you're in a business setting, it's the same thing. Figure out the personalities that are involved and figure out, okay, how can I best communicate with this person? What have I tried in the past that has worked to get through to them and what hasn't worked? And just learn and build and iterate on the relationship just as much as you iterate on the product. Um, I'm sure Nick has something to say because he's dealing with this right now. Uh, we were up late last night talking about that communication gap. So I don't know, Nick, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always going to be there. And I think owning that, owning it and understanding that uh, that gap most of the time is going to exist. I often feel though um, approaching every, everything with evidence and examples for why you may or may not be able to do something uh, is, is the way to counter someone that may not be coming at it from a technical viewpoint. If you're able to say, hey, we're not able to do this, but here's an example of why we can't. This is, you know, with the example of the bad place, showing, hey, this is a bad play and this is the result when we try and analyze that bad play. You as the client don't want to use that data point because it's not an accurate you know, showing of your product, which in the case of the client that Jake was talking about is critically important uh, for, their, for their reputation as a sports analytics company. So if you can approach it with not just 
the what, but the why behind it, I think is is the best thing you can do. You can't avoid the problem entirely, but it's a good step forward. The data, that's, you just reminded me, Nick, of what I always try and remember is data. If you can back up your, your, your you know, opinion with data, then it's very difficult to have a different opinion or argue against that because the other side has to have their own data. So yeah. data doesn't lie. And, and you know what, so this doesn't work all the time, but if you can meet them in the middle as well, I often find that that's a good way to, to compromise. If you can say, hey, we're not able to do this, here's why, but this is what we recommend, or this is what we're able to do instead. Um, that's, that's often helpful, but it may not be available uh, all the time, depending on the product. Okay, I think we've do you still work with the, the client. Uh, do oh, you still work no with the way. client that didn't take the example? Uh, we we communicate with them because they're a, they're a top tier college program that's exper experimenting in data analytics. So we we certainly have the relationship still open. Uh, we're not working with any any products right now with them, but the door is still open. And I would say it's open because of the way that we approach that process. And I think. If you do it with professionalism, if you don't take things personally and you meet their needs in, the, in a productive way and meet the deadlines, then the, the door is most likely always going to be open uh, if new ideas come about. Anybody else? Very true. Pop in chat. As uh, we finish up, again, if there are no other questions, or if you have other questions, now's a good time to ask them. Otherwise, please again, click on the link or the QR code behind me and uh, please complete the survey at the end so that we know how we're doing. Also, the Topics of Tech is a Bentley Plus certified program. So if you're part of that, this counts uh, as uh, your quest toward uh, developing your soft skills here at Bentley through extracurricular activities. Anyone? Nice. Want to unload or un, uh, want to uh, unmute or show your camera? Say hello. Uh, offer some thanks. I will. Then let's take a minute and make some virtual applause for Jake and Nick, and thank them for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. you Happy to connect listening. with anybody on LinkedIn too after this and continue the conversation if folks want. Oh, so